Good morning. Welcome to the next to last day of lecture, which is kind of crazy to think about. These last two days are going to be devoted to the final lecture exam, which is next week. And like a lot of you did yesterday, and some of you will do today, uh, the final lab kind of finishes out the lab part. And so now we just have the lecture part. And if you've taken me for Chem 221 or Chem 222, uh, this final exam will be quite a bit different than the ones we took then. Uh, this final exam, which is over the entire year, is put out by a group called the ACS, and this is their cool little symbol on their website. And the ACS stands for American Chemical Society. And it's the largest professional organization, supposedly, in the world. So chemists of all different persuasions and places, both academics and industrialists, uh, participate in the ACS. And they have these huge conferences. There's actually a Portland Regional Conference coming up, uh, I think it's the week after final week here in Portland. But, but anyway, uh, the, one of the things that the ACS does is they make these types of exams. And they make them for a variety of different classes. Um, they make uh, an ACS exam for Chem 106, for example. Uh, there's one for the organic chemistry, Chem 243, physical chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the advantage of having an exam like that from my perspective is that you know I can get up here and I can teach and I can tell you quick and dirties and give you bad jokes until the end of the world. But do I really know that you're learning it? <laughs> All right, because everything I make is based around my perspective and stuff like that. So if I give an exam like this and my students overall do well, then that's like a pat on my back and it says like, yeah, okay, I guess I am teaching. Okay, <laughs> so this is actually pretty important to me too because I want to know that I'm doing okay and that you. You guys are learning and stuff like that. There are also, though, advantages from your perspective as well as to why this is a good exam. We'll talk about this here in a little bit. Um, so do realize that this will be definitely different than all the exams and stuff you've taken before, but I'll be honest, I expect the different here to be better. So let's talk about it, all right? So this ACS exam, which is the lecture final, all right, those are the same thing. The ACS final, the lecture final, same exact thing. Um, it's put out by this group, the American Chemical Society. Oh, there's another one of those little logos and stuff like that they use. Um, this exam, one reason why it will be better, and quote unquote, is that all of your materials that you've taken so far from me have been based on a raw score. And so what I mean by that is like you get nine out of 10, 90%, eight out of 10, 80%, stuff like that. This exam though, uh, because it's been given out by this huge professional organization, has been given out to, depending on who you talk to, hundreds or even thousands of students in your position already. And they tabulated this data using statistics and things like that to create basically like a scaled system, a scaled score system. So what that means, for example, is that out of all the questions, you don't have to get them all right to get 100%. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but you can miss like five or six of the questions and still get a quote unquote 100% because it's a scaled exam, all right? It's been given out over lots of different people and stuff. So you're gonna have like two possible scores in this exam, all right? You're gonna have then the scaled exam score, which is based on these national averages and stuff like that. You'll also have a raw score, which is like nine out of 10 is 90%, eight out of 10 is 80%. And whichever one is higher, that's the one you're gonna get, all right? So people usually do pretty well on this exam, all right? Which is pretty cool. And I want you to focus on getting a better one and stuff like that. Um, another thing about this midterm which is different is that while every uh, one of my multiple choice questions has had five possible answers, this one only has four, all right? So there's fewer like pieces and stuff to lead you astray. And also, while the midterm questions and stuff like that we've seen this quarter even, some of those get kind of complicated, kind of deep. These are gonna be more like just basic, all right? They're gonna be more, uh, uh, not quite as many steps involved to do them. So, like I said, people usually do pretty well. Now, 
This exam, like I said, is over all of Chem 221 through Chem 223, and that's obviously a lot of information. So there's no way you're going to be able to go back and like learn from you know chapter one up to this point. That would be ridiculous. I do have a study guide. It's in the companion, and it's on the website, and I will send you a link and stuff if you remember. And the study guide has kind of the topics that I want you to look at. And if a topic is not on this list, so for example, molecular orbital theory from Chem 222, if something like that is not on there, then you shouldn't study it, all right? So molecular orbital theory will not be on the ACS study uh, or the ACS exam. Um, hopefully this will give you an idea of some of the topics to look for, all right? If you see a topic on there that you're like, boy, I don't remember that, or oh, I'm a little fuzzy, that would be something to focus in on, all right, and try and like focus on it and take care of business. And of course, you can ask me. So today and Friday, all right, we're just going to go over essentially a series of questions and stuff where I'm going to try and remind you of some of the things we've looked at since the fall in Chem 221, or whenever you took the class. And at any time, if you have questions, of course, let me know. Every question on here, I'm putting up for a reason, <laughs> all right? So hint, hint, hint. So if you feel confident with the kind of questions we're going to see, it should be good to go. On the other hand, if you see something we're going to go over, then you should, and it's not, don't feel confident, that would be a good kind of material to look into. Any questions on any of this kind of stuff? Okay. So <clears throat> what's going to happen, all right, is that for most of you, the lecture final will be a week from today, basically almost exactly one week. It will be in this room at 8.45 in the morning. It's a two-hour midterm. Uh, those of you on Wednesday uh, will also meet uh, Wednesday and stuff. It will be at 1.10 p.m. in the AC2501, so the regular class. Um, the exam itself, when you come, make sure you bring, as always, the calculator, a pencil. You'll need a Scantron with 100 questions total, all right? Uh, the only thing that you'll turn in is the final exam prep worksheet. This is right after problem set six in the companion, or you can get it online. And again, this worksheet is nothing more than a couple of cheesy questions to try and help you start thinking about some of the concepts you'll see on the lecture final. Now, <clears throat> the ACS exam itself is 75 multiple choice questions. So obviously this is more questions, but like I said, they're A, not as deep, all right? So for example, it might just be to find the pH of 0.1 molar HNO3, all right? Minus log of 0.1, that kind of thing. Also, each question only has four possible answers. So if you get one that looks pretty close to one of the answers, then knock on wood, that's probably the right one, which is cool. Um, you'll take the exam Wednesday, either 8.45 or some of you at 1.10. I should have all of your grades up by Thursday. Uh, the ACS study guide is definitely something I would check out and stuff just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on. Yes, Margaret. I hear the exam is more like conceptual rather than like math-based probably. Cool. Um, I would say as the instructor, it's a mix of them, Margaret, but what I would also do is some of the people like in the uh, tutoring area uh, have taken the ACS exam before, and they might be better people, honestly, to talk to and stuff. Sometimes my teacher's perspective is different than what students experience. I dig it. George. Um, what's on one time on Wednesday? So George, you're in what you're in section H1. <clears throat> so you'll meet uh, with me on Wednesday at 1 10 p.m. Unless you really want to come to 1503. Yeah, that's right. Other questions? All right, one more thing. If you look online, and I love it when you Google things, don't get me wrong. If you Google ACS exam Chem 223 or something like that, you will see like sample exams and stuff. People have made sample exams. However, I'm going to give you a big warning on those. Every year, the ACS creates a different exam. So the exam we're using is, for example, not like the current year's version. 
And the reason for it is that every year the focus of the exam changes a little bit. Some ACS exams have had a lot of biochemistry. Some ACS exams have had more environmental chemistry. And those are things we haven't really focused on that much. So I, if you do look things up online and you find a sample ACS exam and you see a bunch of stuff, you're like, what the? <laughs> All right, don't panic. All right, this is just a, reflecting a different ACS exam than we're going to take. The types of ACS questions you're going to see are going to be really well aligned with the things that we've taken in this class. All right, through Chem 221, through Chem 223. So it's not that I would say don't do it, but if you do see questions that are weird or something like that, uh, that's, that's also understandable. Some of the ACS exams have been like only one hour exams too. There, there's a whole bunch of different variations. So, so be cautious, be conservative if you look things up online because it may not be quite the type of thing we're going to see here. Questions on that? All right. So these next few questions and stuff that I'm going to go through with both today and Friday, all right, are just some of the concepts that you very well might see on the lecture all right? So hopefully a lot of these things are going to be like, seriously like, you know, come on, Russell, we've been through this already kind of things. But the goal, again, is just to kind of keep you up to speed and stuff with the types of concepts you might see. So as an example of that, here's a question from either Chem 221 or Chem 222, depending on what you think. It's a question about iron 58. And see if you can figure out which of those would be the best answer here. So on a question like this, this is a question on isotopes. And uh, the 58 right there is going to be a key to figuring this out. And if you remember from Chem 221 or the end of Chem 222, the periodic table always has three pieces of information in it. Well, it's a good periodic table. Uh, there's the uh, molar mass number, which on these periodic tables in this room is the red number. There's the symbol for the element. So for example, Fe is iron. Uh, but the most important thing for this question is the atomic number. And on this periodic table, it's the blue hole number, which for iron is 26. So all of these 26 ups here are coming from the periodic table, all right? Um, iron has 26 protons. That's what that atomic number means. And if you have a neutral atom of iron, you will have an equal number of electrons. So you'd have 26 protons and 26 electrons. But when it comes to isotopes, the reason we have isotopes is that the neutrons are different. So this thing, the 58, is called the mass number. It's the protons plus neutrons. So if you want to find the number of neutrons, you take the mass number 58, you subtract the 26 number of protons, and this thing here should have 32 neutrons, all right? So the 32 uh, would be a different element. 32 would be germanium up there, all right? And then uh, 
the electrons, if you had more electrons than protons, that would make this a negative ion. It wouldn't be neutral. Any questions? Cool. So again, this is the kind of stuff we're going to go through, some stuff that you've seen. And don't be afraid to ask questions and uh, just try it. So. Speaking of which, here's a compound with nitrogen and oxygen. All right, and there's a whole bunch of different combinations of nitrogen and oxygen, but this one has 46.67% nitrogen. See if you can use this information to find the empirical formula of this nitric oxide compound. Those percentages are usually mass percentages. That would be a hint. See if you can figure out what that would be. Almost always in chemistry, the percentages are based on mass. So like percent yield, actual yield, those are basically mass things. So what I would recommend on a problem like this is you just assume 100 grams. So then 100 grams would be 46.67 grams of nitrogen. And you'd have 100 minus 46.67 grams of the oxygen, the other component. But Hunter uses 0.4667, that's fine too. And then one minus 0.4667 would be the grams of oxygen either way. Um, formulas like this are based on moles. So we've got to do the grams to moles conversion for both N to O. And then when you get it, you want to make sure that the numbers are whole numbers, all right? Especially for empirical formulas. So when you do this, it comes out to be B. Most of you saw that, well done. So again, what I did, again, is I assumed 100 grams, so I don't have to think too hard. 46.67, and then, as it turns out, 53.33 grams of O. And then you convert them into moles. Again, 14.01 comes from the periodic table. So if you look under nitrogen, it's 14.0067, whatever. If you round it up, 14.01 and the same thing for oxygen. And you can see that the ratio is almost exactly one to one, so that by essentially just if you round up to one sig fig, it would be NO, nitrogen monoxide. Any questions on this? Sweet. Here's an example of a problem. You're making ammonia, 
all right? And you have two quantities, hint, hint, uh, going in. You've got so many moles of nitrogen, and you've got so many moles of hydrogen. So see if you can use that information to see how many moles of ammonia will be created. In chemistry, um, one of the big precepts is what's called law of mass action, and that just means that the mass that goes in can't be greater than or equal or less than the mass that comes out, or you have to account for everything. And so on one level, it's tempting then to say, oh yeah, okay, 10 moles and 25 moles, uh, feels like it might be 35 moles, all right? But that's not the way that these kind of problems work out. A mole is uh, related to mass, but it's different. And the other thing is that if you assume that uh, like all of the moles react, it'll be different than if you have a limiting reactant. And that's what we're dealing with right here. So you can see that one mole of N2 needs three moles of hydrogen. And we have 10 moles of nitrogen, all right? So if we had an exact amount of hydrogen needed to react with the N2, we would need three to one or three times this number, all right? And we do not have 30 moles of hydrogen, all right? We only have 25. So if you see like two reactant amounts, that's almost always going to be a limiting reactant problem. And it doesn't state it's a limiting reactant problem, but the hip chemist knows that if you see two amounts, then probably one of them will be in excess, and the other one, the important one, will be the limiting reactant. So in a problem like this, what I would do is I'd try and figure out the moles of ammonium uh, that would be created by both reactants. So as an example, going from nitrogen to ammonium, it's a two to one ratio. So one mole of N2 will create two moles of ammonium. So if we have 10 moles of nitrogen, we should create 20 moles of ammonium. And that would be answer A. 
But because it, there are two reactant amounts, you really need to check both of them. So 25 moles of H2, if we wanted to convert that to NH3, we would use the stoichiometric factor, which means that three moles of H2 need two, will create two moles of ammonia, or 25 times two thirds is what you would do. And if you go 25 times two thirds, this is where answer B pops out. So B is what chemists call the theoretical yield. It's the maximum amount of ammonia that can be created. We would also call the hydrogen here the limiting reactant, all right? It's limiting how much ammonia can come out. Like you can see here, the hydrogen is creating 16.7 moles. That's less than the nitrogen is creating. So the smaller quantity is the theoretical yield. It stems from the limiting reactant. The N2 would be the excess reactant, which is something we talked about in Chem 221. And notice that you have to think about the stoichiometries. Like if you just look at 10 versus 25, it seems like, oh yeah, 10's a lot smaller than 25. That would be limiting. But not necessarily. It depends on these ratios. <laughs> Uh, of the different uh, pieces of the balanced chemical equation. So, any questions? Yeah, George. So we get a problem with this. You can do it for um, H2 and N2, and then whichever ends up with the least amount of moles is the answer? Exactly, that's right. That's the way I kind of am trying to push you towards it. There are other ways to do it, totally, George, but that seems to be the most efficient, in my opinion, anyways. But it's not the only way to do it, and if you have your favorite way of doing it, do it. But yes. <laughs> Other questions? This is important because if you work at a chemical company uh, and you tell them, oh yeah, we'll make 20 moles of ammonia, but you can only at the maximum make 16.7, you're fired! So yeah, so uh, you gotta be able to control these things. I remember we talked about percent yield and you don't usually make this much and stuff, so you've gotta be able to give your boss or the employer or the company or whatever, you know, an accurate amount of how much can be made. So this is pretty important. Anyway, questions? Which of these would be the best conductor of electricity in aqueous solution? Another term for a conductor of electricity would be an electrolyte. So see if you can think about which of these would be an excellent electrolyte. And you, we talked about this both in Chem 221 and in Chem 223 this term. One of those is a lot different than the other ones. See if you can figure out which one it is.
All right, this is a good question. So uh, uh, lots of different uh, answers here. So let's talk about what's going on. So first of all, all of these up here are acids or bases, all right? So this is a question then uh, that does incorporate both Chem 221 and Chem 223. Which of the ones up here is a base? NH3, that's right, NH3 is a base and stuff we've been using in the lab. The other ones are acids, all right? But it's not about acids versus bases here, all right? When it comes to acids and bases, we categorize them as two different types of uh, strengths, all right? We talked about the strong acids versus weak acids and the strong bases versus the weak bases. So let's go through here and see if we can figure out if these are strong acids or weak acids, or in this one case, strong base or weak base. What's the name of this acid? Acetic acid, that's right, that stinky stuff we've been using in lab. We've a lot of you used yesterday, some of you used it today. Anyway, acetic acid, strong acid or weak acid? Weak, that's right. It has an equilibrium constant, a K sub A of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. I'm the nerdy instructor, you don't need to know that. But anyway, yeah, K less than 1, very reactant favored. H3PO4, what's the name of that acid? Phosphoric, I heard it, good. Say it loud, be proud, yeah. H3PO4 is phosphoric acid. Strong acid or weak acid? Okay, let's go through the list of strong acids just to make sure we're clear on that. All right, the five strong acids, all right? HCl, HI, <coughs> HBr, HNO3, and HClO4. Is H3PO4 on that list? No, so it's a weak acid, all right? Again, that crazy five strong acids, three strong bases. Uh, really important. So this is also a weak acid. Again, it's not HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, or HClO4. Weak acid, all right? NH3, is that a strong or weak base? Weak base. Weak base, that's right. The three strong bases, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, ammonia is not on that list, so it's weak. HBr, strong acid, good. HIO is iotis, hypoiotis acid. That's very weird acid. Strong or weak? Weak. It's not one of the magic five, all right? Notice that four of the five up here are weak, all right? Weak acid, weak acid, weak base, and this one's a weak acid. Does that mean they'll have a K greater than one or less than one? Less than one, all right? A, B, C, and E, if you looked them up, would have a Ka or a Kb, which was a lot less than one. So that means they're going to be very reactant favor. So for example, for acetic acid, you would write acetic acid plus water, making acetate plus hydronium. And it's the acetate and hydronium that have charges on them. You can't conduct electricity unless you have things with charges on them. So A, B, C, and E won't have a lot of charges. They won't have a lot of electrolytic power because they're weak. Most of them will stay in the molecular form, like NH3 plus water will be much more prevalent than NH4 plus and hydroxide. Only HBr is going to dissociate 100% in water, and that's what makes a strong acid a strong acid, or the strong bases strong bases. You really don't have any HBr in water. It's all H plus or H3O plus and Br minus. So you have a lot of ions in there. The strong acids and strong bases conduct electricity really well, all right? It's like sodium chloride even and stuff like that. They're 100% dissociated. The more ions you have, uh, the stronger the reaction, the better it's going to conduct electricity. So strong electrolytes and strong acids and strong bases, uh, they all will conduct electricity really, really well. And you, to conduct electricity, you can have just regular ionic compounds. So like sodium ions and nitrate ions are very water soluble. They would conduct electricity well too. But man, all the strong acids and strong bases will conduct electricity really, really well. Any questions? Um, if we were to have on E, a strong base, mm -hmm. but we just try to calculate both their charges. Oh, um, 
So first of all, on the ACS exam, that would be a out of bounds kind of question, all right, to know that. Um, honestly, uh, that would be a tougher one to find. We'd have to find like a percent ionization and uh, to ground, they're both in the high 90s, um, if it was like sodium hydroxide versus HBr. Um, so you won't, you won't see questions like that, I'll be honest. But what you'd, if you had that kind of question, yeah, you'd look up something like, there's like ionization percentages you can look up with these, kind, and we haven't really talked about that, but the larger percentage would be that. Most of these are like 99% plus, but which one would be higher, I'm not totally sure myself. Good, good question. Other questions? Outstanding. Net ionic equations is something that I've been pushing subtly in the QA1 and QA3 labs because it will be something that you'll see next week a little bit too. So I'd like you to try and find out which of those represents the net ionic equation for potassium hydroxide and iron 2 chloride, making iron 2 hydroxide and potassium chloride. So see if you can use that information to see which of those would be the net ionic equation, or net ionic reaction, which is the same thing. called uh, net ionic reactions the action of the reaction in Chem 221 because it shows the parts that are really coming together to make something. And uh, in this reaction, what it's saying is that potassium hydroxide, KOH, and iron 2 chloride are combining to make iron 2 hydroxide and potassium chloride. Now, anything with a K, always a Q. And chloride is usually a Q as well, unless it's with silver, mercury, or lead, the group one cations. But hydroxides are usually insoluble, unless they're with K, so stuff like that. So you can probably figure out then that this thing is going to be a solid, it's insoluble. And a lot of you put answer A, which is cool. This is the balanced molecular equation. All right, so if uh, George and I are going to do this reaction, we'll have two parts potassium hydroxide for every one FeCl2, making FeOH2 and KCl. But let's say, though, that George and I go to the stockroom, we've got the iron 2 chloride. Ah, oh, no potassium hydroxide. Ah, oh, darn that stockroom people. Don't. Maria, I'm just giving you a bad time. I'm not being serious. Anyway, if we don't have potassium hydroxide, we may be okay because potassium is a spectator. It isn't involved in the chemistry. And to determine that, you never break up solids or liquids. All right, keep them as they are. 
but anything that's AQ, you break up into the cation and the anion. So really, you don't have KOH, you have K plus and OH minus. And you don't really have FeCl2, you have Fe2 plus and 2Cl minus. What you want to do is go through and find pieces that are on both sides of the equation in aqueous compounds. So you can probably see that K is in an aqueous compound on both sides, and Cl is in an aqueous compound on both sides. What do we call K plus and Cl minus in these kind of reactions? Spectators, well done. They just sit on the side and they kind of watch around, all right? <clears throat> so George is hip enough to realize that, hey, Russell, potassium is just a spectator here. We could just as well use sodium instead of potassium. So instead of KCl, you'd have NaCl, another spectator ion. It's no problem. So if you pull out the K plus and the Cl minus, you end up with what is truly the net ionic equation, all right? It's the hydroxides and the iron two plus making FeOH2. The chloride and the potassium literally are spectators, so you don't have to use those. That's why it's cool to substitute KOH for NaOH or LiOH, another spectator. And instead of uh, FeCl2, you could probably use like FeBr2 or something. Just have the iron there, but with a different source. And as a chemist, this is kind of important, because inevitably the chemical you want is not present. This is a way to work around it. Any questions? Fun just keeps on going. What's the molarity or concentration of this sodium carbonate? You've got 6.73 grams in 250 milliliters of water. There's the molar mass, don't have to calculate it. What's the molarity? Molarity is moles per liter, so you need to turn the grams into moles using the molar mass, and you need to turn the milliliters into liters. How many milliliters in a liter? A thousand, right on. So to convert 250, you divide by a thousand, you get 0 0.250 liters. Grams to moles, 0.254 moles per liter. <clears throat> So again, you can see how the molar mass, the grams need to cancel, so you have moles. Divide by the volume in liters, 0 0.250 liters. <coughs> Any questions? Cool. What's the oxidation number, or charge, of the manganese in KMnO4? So think about your use of charges. Remember that all of those charges together have to go to zero because it's a neutral compound. See if you can find what the charge is on the negative.
So oxygen is usually negative two, potassium, like sodium, usually plus one. So it's like plus one, plus whatever manganese is, plus four negative two oxygens. And all of that equals the charge on the compound or ion, if any. And this is neutral. So it's like plus one, plus x, minus a to equal zero. Solve for the x. And almost everybody saw it was plus seven. Well done. So again, you can use this kind of math thing if you want to. If there was a charge, you would just put the charge right there instead of zero. Any questions on that? Good. Um, I'm gonna show this question. We may not have enough time to do it formally, but this is a lot like what we have done. If you wanted to find the enthalpy for a reaction like this, Remember, it's almost always the enthalpies of the products minus the enthalpies of the reactants. And you can see here that there's three enthalpies given, but there's no enthalpy for oxygen. Why is there no enthalpy for oxygen? Zero, that's right. It's an element in a standard state. So see real fast if you can figure out the enthalpy. If you can, it's all right on regular time. <coughs> The only uh, thing to remember is that it's products minus reactants. Multiply the water by two because of that two right there. If you had oxygen, you'd do it by two, but it's zero. <clears throat> the answer comes out to be this negative 14.8.8. Remember that delta G values will also be zero for the elements, but entropy values will always be positive. Any questions on that? Cool. We'll do more of this on Friday. Have a wonderful day.